Hello and welcome to DDoCast episode 320, recorded on January 18th and 19th. I'm your host Patrick. With me this week is mostly no one, but we'll have a guest for the round table later in the show. Uh, this week's screenshot is Rezlez stumbles across a Marut in the jungle of Kyber in our 155th DDO screenshot of the week. Thank you puppies and rainbows for sending in the screenshot. It's a nice uh, little screenshot, a little dark, a little ominous, but uh, there's the Marut uh, from Vaughn 3 probably uh, approaching in the background there. We like to talk about Dungeons & Dragons online nearly every weekend. You can catch us through Google Plus Hangouts, YouTube, or from our website at ddocast.com. Ditocast is hosted by Cyber Ears, the awesome podcast hosting network. Recorded shows are usually available within a few days of recording. Uh, the next show will probably be next weekend, uh, and you can stay up to date by following us on our social media pages or our website, ditocast.com, with our calendar. On the podcast this week, uh, we have some early feedback news for stuff that's coming to the game, uh, and we also have, for our roundtable discussion, TR Tips. That's reincarnation tips. Uh, so that'll be a good, fun discussion there. In the news this week, uh, there was some downtime and maintenance. Uh, on Wednesday, January 15th, there was some server maintenance and account maintenance. Uh, and then Thursday, January 16th, they restarted uh, the servers to activate the winter games. Um, although I'm not entirely sure why they didn't do those both at the same time. Um, however, the second that restart ended up in a second restart to address an issue that came up. Uh, there was some news on the new Divine Destiny uh, from Palato. He said, thanks for everyone for your interest and input in last month's post on the new Divine Epic Destiny. Based on your feedback, we've made some changes to our design, and we'd like to share with you where things are headed for this new Destiny. Some of the key suggestions we've gathered so far from last month's thread. Uh, one, having the new Destiny be melee-centric to the exclusion of other niches like spellcasting may be undesirable. Two, including a boost to Divine Spell DCs would be great. Three, making some changes and improvements to Unyielding Sentinel and Exalted Angel would be most welcome. In addition to the above suggestions, another idea that may, uh, many seemed to like was for substantially reworking the two existing Divine Destinies to allow for the new Destiny to be a purely offensive Divine caster. He speaks to the number four first. This idea has some merit, but it would require a lot of time, and more importantly, a lot more time than we actually have to work on Destinies for the near and midterm future. We've got a full schedule of other improvements, and a major rework of multiple Destinies is too big a task to fit in. So instead of doing this, we're going to tackle the other suggestions on the above list by acting on these. We think we should be able to address some of the concerns that many people suggest, number four, because there's some good overlap between them. To address points one and two above, we will likely be making the new Destiny fit a more hybrid melee spellcaster role, a little like Warpriest. This doesn't mean it will be a watered down and ineffective at both, and rather it will have a strong mix of viable options for melees as well as caster hybrids. The new Destiny will be strong in melee and be fun for melee-oriented characters to play, but it will also have some key spellcasting abilities and enhancements that will be of interest to Divine Casters. There's just significant boosts to Divine Casting DCs and some strong spell-like abilities. In order to address point three, we'd also like to make a set of changes to the other two Divine Epic Destinies to adjust their roles and amplify their power level. While this will definitely amount to less than a complete reworking of the trees, we hope to be able to go through the trees and make several changes for the better. Some of these will include giving more melee potency to the Unyielding Sentinel and giving more healing emphasis and general spell efficiency to the Exalted Angel. As we get closer to filling out the new Destiny's tree, we'll be looking at this thread as well as through the 14 pages of the original thread to see if we can incorporate any more of your ideas. Thanks for your input. And then Varguil actually posted in the thread as well. Um, In regards to the capstone hit point boost from the Sentinel Destiny, he says, The protection is intended to be time-based, not hit point-based. We realize that this was poorly received since we poorly set up the expectation. A possible translation here would be to simply make you invulnerable for 20 seconds, which was the intended goal. It happened to be simpler to grant an intentionally excessive amount of temporary hit points than to make you fully invulnerable, so that shortcut was taken in order to spend more time on other epic destiny work. But this is a good example of how presentation matters and we could have done better. There are, of course, other possible changes which we are happy for players to suggest as part of our re-examination of Divine Epic Destinies, but the intent was never to actually grant 10,000 temporary hit points for full use. Any more than Unyielding Sovereignty is expected to actually heal 10,000 hit points. Again, sorry for the confusion. He also wrote regarding the Lay on Hands uses and regenerations, that Lay on Hands doesn't regenerate at all without endless Lay on Hands. The 10% reduction after that does stack in the same 
as that plus one land hand stack. So rank three is 20% faster than rank one in addition to providing plus two land hands uses. We can try to clarify that text further to make that clear and more consistent with how we usually present that information. So it looks like they're going to do a little bit more work based on some player feedback, and it sounds pretty good to me. Looking forward to seeing that new Divine Destiny. Also in the news this week, Steel Star gave us an early raid preview for Update 21, which was actually nothing but a giant tease. Uh, what it actually was was a Lotro community update from November, uh, and he happens to be in the background of some of the shots working on the raid. Um, so it's <laughs> it's a very early look. It doesn't really say anything. It's just a big tease for everything. Um, although I will mention that in the video uh, that Team Turbine raised $46,000 plus dollars for extra life just from players uh, on the Lotro community, I think. Um, so, hey, props to you guys. That's uh, pretty awesome. And also, interestingly enough, uh, this video, video had some uh, feedback from the Players' Counter for Lotro, uh, which has been adapted to uh, the DDO community. Although they did fly out the uh, Lotro players to Turbine, it doesn't look like they're going to do that for the DDO Players' Council. Um, so, uh, Robin Klopper uh, wrote that uh, on the forums that it's great to read that Von 3 XP will be corrected in the next update. The XP was ridiculous high, and the quest really not challenging besides Epic Elite. Um, and he went on to kind of give a... Uh, have a, a new idea or a suggestion um, that why don't you guys adjust weekly uh, a new quest for the daily run with a bit overbalanced XP for bait so all players will at least get familiar with that quest even forgotten items, shards, seals, etc. will be farmed automatically. Could be refreshing and wake interest to play more on common quests again and again for a week uh, next week and that a new quest would be chosen. Should be available on Epic only for sure. Uh, and Virgul popped into that thread and posted that this was interesting ideas. Uh, so we might see some uh, some of that incorporated later. Sounds like a pretty good idea to me. There are a few pugs that were discussed this week. Um, in the Purple Dragon Knights, uh, Steel Star wrote that they are working on fixes for Final Stand and Save Boost, working on players in addition to hirelings in the vicinity. Um, the uh, Sun Fury Weapon Enhancement, uh, Melange wrote that Sorry about this, folks. Uh, while trying to make uh, this version of Sun Fury keep up with other current mutations, she accidentally messed up and uh, messed up its level. Uh, should be easy to fix on this end, uh, and we'll check to make sure that other mutations from that update are at the correct levels while she's at it. There was a uh, an issue with uh, in House K with the turning on of the Winter Festivals. The House K Ziggurat was accidentally turned into an Ice Pyramid. Uh, it wasn't intended to be on live yet and was promptly turned off, which was probably what the uh, extra restart was for. Um, although I didn't get a good look at it myself, I just heard about it. Um, but uh, some interesting things going on there for sure. Um, hopefully they don't make it too hard to get up to that, up to the uh, raid that's up in the bank atop the pyramid, also the patron. Uh, but we'll see when it comes out. There's also a problem with uh, the door to the shrine in Vaughn 1. Uh, that was addressed. Uh, what happens is after you kill all the trolls just before you enter the arena, the door to the shrine closes. It's not supposed to do so. Uh, in fact, it's actually supposed to be the opposite. It's supposed to open when all the trolls die. Um, that's been fixed internally and it should be live with update 21. There were no bonus days this week. Uh, however, the winter festivities have begun. You can play the Rusia Ice Games and the Midwinter Festival. Uh, and those should be available until February 17th. In the store news this week, uh, you can get 25% off of character slots, questing tools, SP potions, and healing items. The freebie for the week, always a nice one, is the small jewel of fortune. The code is LUX94. You can get one per account. On the uh, DDO Chronicle this week, um, Enrique looks at the origin of Zawabi in a new blog post. And Mickey chronicles her latest questing and fights in some caged trolls in a new post. You can check those out. The guild for the week uh, is the Thelonis Guild Order of the Protector. It's recruiting new players. They are a small guild with an airship, but like to focus on helping new players get used to and enjoy other enjoy the DDO experience. If you are a newer player who would like a friendly guild to explore and ask questions, let us know. And if you are a veteran player and would like to help new players learn. Uh, they're recruiting for a few positions there as well. You can send a message to either uh, Cleronius, Marhana, or Osberg, and happy adventuring. 
the Chronicle comment for the week was, what do you like most about DDO in three words or less? And I would have to say uh, Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> it's kind of an easy one uh, for me, but I like Dungeons and I like Dragons. I like uh, going into both of them. Although Friends is uh, is also a, a good answer to that. Um, so I guess I'd have to have used four words. Uh, DDO Gamer looks at an excellent quarter staff in a new post. Uh, it was a plus six arcanic er, anarchic quarter staff of anarchic burst. Um, so it's a very chaotic staff. Better watch out; it might uh, might hit him in the head. Hopefully, it's not an intelligent staff. Uh, DDO Cast also got a shout out for our making plat episode last week. There was a community update video this week. Um, it was mostly about the Players Council, the Winter Festivals. And uh, pretty much just a rehash of the Chronicle that was released last Friday, but we'll have that in the show notes for you to peruse. Um, featured forum topic uh, this week. Uh, this was actually a response on the forums to a question about how to approach defense in DDO's current formatting. Uh, it was written by Permaband. It's a pretty good summary, uh, so I thought I'd share it. Uh, he writes that first, defense chance at level, which is a section in the character sheet that pops up when you highlight uh, armor class. It'll give you a little percentage uh, kind of at the bottom summarizing your defenses. Uh, he writes that that is possibly the most useless stat in the game. Ignore it. Uh, probably pretty good advice. Uh, the only thing that that's really good at, uh, in my opinion, is a relative bar. Uh, as your defenses increase, it kind of increases as well. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a gauge uh, for how you how well you have improved. But He's right. It's not really a very useful stat in other terms. Um, says second, while in heroics, AC is great and equal, if not superior, to dodge. After all, dodge has a 25% cap. Hard, uh, if not impossible, to achieve in heroic level, especially on a non-monk. It only comes into play after they hit through your AC. Knowing nothing of your tune beyond level 14 fighter, I would say keep the heavy armor. If your AC is high enough, you're getting missed a lot. Dodge won't matter much. And when you do get hit, PRR will reduce it. When you get to epics, uh, a switch flips, sort of. If you're running harder or especially normal, AC is still very effective, and when combined with mid-high PRR, Hemi Arbor is the way to go for a low-dodge fighter build. If you're running elites, AC is almost pointless, and dodge becomes much more important. So there's a balancing act. He recommends that you get your dodge as high as you can, and then armor around it. Basically, wear the heaviest armor that doesn't restrict your dodge, and stack on as much PRR as you can. I would say that's a, a fairly good... Um, summary of defenses and how to approach them. The only thing I might say to that is um, I think it, at Epics, particularly if you're doing Epic Elite, uh, you pretty much have two options, um, PRR and uh, Dodge. Those are kind of the two things that are going to keep you alive more so than anything. That's not to say that AC isn't uh, valuable and doesn't work at those levels. It's just a lot harder to get up to a very high value, and you need to have one of the other two to really supplement it. Uh, if you can get a little bit of the third, uh, that helps a lot. Um, but you are going to get hit, and you are going to get hit pretty often, particularly when you're fighting bosses, um, even if you have really high AC, just because of the way that the AC curve works. Um, so it's pretty good advice there. Um, there was also a forum thread asking, what do you consider pay to win? Um, so if you want to get in on that conversation, I will link that in the show notes as well. Um, me, personally, I don't really consider much to be pay to win. Um, as long as they're not necessarily giving out raid loot, uh, that would probably be, um, at least other than tomes, if you start giving out raid loot, it kind of cheapens the value of running the raids. Um, I don't mind it so much from the standpoint of uh, people being able to purchase it so much as it the way that it would negatively impact how much raids are run. Um, so I, I don't know that I, I would ever like to see any really named loot uh, being given out uh, that you could pay for. Uh, at least in terms of turbine points and dollars spent and stuff like that, you know, trading stuff is is one another thing entirely. Um, however, uh, I, I kind of view most of the game as more as pay to play. Um, so whatever your however many dollars you're spending, that's how much you're play, paying to play the game. Um, so really, that can that's kind of how I tend to think about it more in terms of. Um, so as long as they don't start offering uh, really valuable loot uh, in the system other than tomes, uh, which I don't really mind, um, then I might have some concerns about pay to win. But until we get to that point, uh, I am a pretty happy camper. There's also uh, Cordovan set up a thread where fan art can be nominated for inclusion on DDO.com. So there's a uh, a new thread that we'll link in the show notes that's uh, up for that. 
Uh, and now uh, what we're going to do is we're going to move into our roundtable discussion uh, that I recorded earlier this weekend. Uh, so please enjoy. Welcome, DDOcast listeners. Uh, this is going to be a fun little treat. We are going to be talking about uh, TR tips. That's tips for reincarnating. I uh, have a new guest with me named Stocks. Say hello, Stocks. Hi, I'm Stocks. And this is a guy that I run with a lot, uh, and he has been doing a lot of reincarnating over the years. Uh, do you have an approximate number-ish about how many times you've reincarnated? Uh, hundred. So uh, a lot. Over the TRs, over the TRs, ERs, and uh, Iconics, yeah. Well, I guess around a hundred. Awesome. So we've got a, an expert in-house for this. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, so we're going to start off by... Uh, Kind of what is a re true reincarnation? Um, it's a little different than just an epic reincarnation because a true reincarnation, you basically make a new character, but you get to keep all of your old gear. Uh, you kind of keep some aspects of your character, uh, like you get to keep your tomes, stuff like that. But you get to change, essentially build a new character um, with an extra little bonus feat called a past life feat. Um, you get to change your race. Uh, you start at level 1 or 15 if you're an iconic uh, character on your reincarnation, uh, and you get to rebuild it from the ground up. Uh, what, uh, for you, Stocks, what kind of appeals to you about the reincarnation system? Why do you like to reincarnate? Ah, uh, well, I think DDO is a, a game where one of the biggest aspects of the whole thing is, is personalization and uh, basically tweening, tweaking out the finer points of the, the character. I mean, you'll see you know, the difference between a plus 10 and a plus 11 stat is astronomical, where even in game, it's, it's uh, I mean, the difference is so minuscule, right? But in a game where you're just going after the very best, it's a lot of people's personalities to do exactly that. And uh, TRing and ERing and just reincarnating period basically allows you to, to kind of go after that a bit more. And... Um, obviously gives you a, a cumulative effect. So the more you work at it, the better and better. And I mean, at the end of the day, when you TR a lot, that's all going to add in uh, to a better character overall, for sure. I think also that something that, act, that at least appeals to me is you get to kind of play with different builds, but with a character that you've already kind of been working on. So it's not necessarily just, you have to, don't, have to start from scratch. You have to find all the gear that you might want from the build. You can kind of play a little bit with some of the stuff you already have and kind of see how things work a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, the advantage of um, I'm in the middle of one right now where I've discovered a, a brand new build for myself that I'm very much enjoying. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to now roll up a tune whose build is exactly that. Uh, and the only way I found that was by you know, the, the whole TR system where you're, you you get to just play with things a little bit and see what you can come up with because you know you're not going to be there for long, right? Indeed. Uh, so let's start by talking about how do you prepare for a reincarnation? What kind of things do you go through to make sure that you're ready before you actually do that? <laughs> well, I'm going to offer up some sage sage advice here. First one, never do it when you're tired. I've uh, <laughs> apparently I have to do this every once in a while to remind myself, but I do a TR tired, and I end up uh, waking up the next day. You log on, and <laughs> it wasn't at all what you were thinking or had planned for. So that's tip number one: don't do it when you're falling asleep. Uh, number two, what would I say? Silver flame pots are a big one if you're a soloer. Uh, um, especially a melee class. Uh, I mean, you want to use certain things. You want to build up your favor for certain things. Like if you can get a plus two tome out of it and that character still needs it, that would mean you want to build up your uh, your overall favor to 1750. If you're sitting at, you know, maybe 1700. And it'll take you minimal effort. Um, or... Uh, yeah, silver flame favor, go up to 400 if you're at 380 or something. Obviously, these things don't apply if your your favor is much lower. Um, so it sounds like one of the things you're looking at is, is favor, like 
making sure that you've hit some favorite benchmarks that you're, you either want to get before you TR or that you're really close to getting. So that would probably also include like rounding off to about 100 favors so you can get a couple extra turbine points. Uh, you mentioned the tomes uh, as well. And then silver flame pots, which is, for those who don't know, it's a, it's a heal potion. It has a drawback. It reduces your stats by negative 10 when you use it, so it can make you helpless, but it can give you a, a really big jolt of healing just from a potion, which you can only get if you have 400 favor uh, from the Silver Flame faction. Um, so a lot of folks will basically stock up, as it were, on stuff that they won't, consumables that they won't be able to buy in their new life until they reach a certain favor point. Do you do that with the Yugo pots too, or just the Silver Flame potions? Uh, the odd tune, I'll do that with Yugo pots as well. Yeah, exactly, for sure. Awesome. Uh, are there other things that you like to do before you TR? Another little tip for any ranged characters out there, or sorry, archer characters. Uh, if you're an arcane archer, you conjure up a couple, just one or two stacks of your... Uh, no, no, not one or two, I guess 20, uh, however many extra you can fit in your um, inventory, and then uh, those go into your TR bank, and you have plus five arrows off the gun instead of, uh, you know, going back to masterwork or plus one. It's a bonus. What else is there? Uh, something else that I'm not... I know there's something else that I do. Well, there's... Um at least for me, I, I definitely do go through the kind of the favor checklist. I usually check to see um, these days. Check my sagas. Uh, if I'm not kind of sure where they're at, I might check to see if there's like maybe I'm within a quest or two of achieving a saga that I might want to do something for. Um, so that's something. I check to make sure there's not any quests that I might want to go grab an end reward for. Um, particularly like maybe a chain quest. Make sure you know maybe I'm within one quest of completing a chain and getting a chain reward, like in Giant Hold or something like that would also be uh, a little remiss if we didn't mention uh, some tips on how do you empty your reincarnation bank. So if you reincarnate, you get a, a bank full of basically all the stuff you had before. Uh, you, once you pull it out of that bank, you can't put it back in. So it, it can be something of a storage option. You can throw some stuff in there that you don't think you're going to use for a while. But once you pull it out, uh, you can't put it back in. And you have to empty that reincarnation cache uh, before you reincarnate. Uh, and basically, anything that's in your inventory and your personal bank goes into that cache when you reincarnate. Plus, you know, if you do an iconic, you get a couple of uh, cosmetic goodies that go in there as well. Uh, but pretty much, uh, if it's in there, it has to come out before you can reincarnate, which can cause some space issues. Uh, so the first thing is uh, find some stuff in your inventory. Uh, if you know, if you're full and you can't <laughs> you can't find a place to unload some of the stuff, you don't want to throw anything away. Uh, well, that's the first step. Throw anything that you don't want away or sell it. Uh, get rid of it, however you can. Then look at stuff that's not bound in any way, shape, or form. If it's not bound, uh, you can throw it in your uh, shared bank if you want. You can throw it in the guild chest. You can mail it to yourself uh, on another, you know, mail it to another tune. Let it just bounce back. Um, that can be a pretty nice way to get it out of your hair for uh, about two and a half weeks. Um, so, actually more than that, because... What happens is it, it sits in the other character's mailbox for two weeks and it comes back to your character uh, and sits there until... Uh, you have to make sure that you take it out so that you don't... It, it doesn't just disappear and get deleted. Uh, but that can be a way of having something kind of disappear for a while. Um, then what you want to do is find the stuff that's bound to account. That's stuff that you can put in your shared bank. Uh, use that as a little bit of a, a place you can store some stuff. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, bound to character on equip items, what you can do with those is put them on the shard house. Uh, put a very high shard, <laughs> a high buyout on them, you know, something that no one's going to reasonably buy. Uh, it won't cost you much in terms of shards. It doesn't take that much to uh, to put stuff on there. It's about five shards uh, for something that's actually bound to character. Um, and you can only put bound to character on equip items in there. But what it lets you do is, It'll put it in there for three days. Uh, and at the end of those three days, it'll bounce back and it gives you your shards back. Uh, so you don't lose any shards in that process. So that's something else that you can do there as well. Of course, really that, you might have to get rid of some stuff. You might have to delete or sell some bound stuff. Uh, you might have to make some hard choices. Uh, so there you go. Try and, uh, I would say, get rid of stuff 
first that is more low level stuff. You know, you're not going to spend that much time at low levels, and when you're done, if you ever finish, you're not going to stay at low levels. You're going to end up with a higher level character. So keep that in mind as well as you start to find some stuff that you need to get rid of. I'm also going to have a, uh, in the show notes, I'll have a, a link for a forum page that has a, uh, basically it's a, it's a giant checklist of uh, what some some things are that, it's kind of a robust checklist of what you might want to do before you TR, um, but it has a, a I mean, it's, it's a really long checklist, but we'll have that linked in the show notes as well. Just thought of the other one there. Uh... I guess you could term it almost rounding off for all this stuff, but um, also round off your raids. You would check your um, uh, your raid counters, and if you're close to 20 on any of them, you would likely just wait it out that extra three, six, nine days, and uh, or use a lot of the, the raid, raid bypasses. The, or use raid bypasses exactly to get there. Awesome. Let's talk about. Um, Maybe let's talk about leveling. Uh, tips on leveling a character up because when you TR, you have to. If it's your first life, your second life will take uh, more XP, and then your third and any uh, any life after that third life takes about I think it's double the amount of XP to go from one to twenty. Epic levels is the same amount of XP. It doesn't matter what life you're on, but levels one to twenty cost more XP. Uh, so let's talk about tips for leveling, getting through the levels. Uh, let's see. Well, first thing, one of the things I uh, have just definitely been paying attention to lately is, uh, uh, I guess, are we including talk about um, the uh, learning tomes, tomes of learning? Sure. So with the tomes of learning, um, if you do your... Uh, uh, elite bravery bonus. Um, yeah, you get a you get a, uh, an extra bonus that goes up. Um, how do you put this? Well, it's the, it's the first time it bonus with the tomes. Right, and and so there's that. Am I talking about the same bonus? It's the one that goes up by ten, twenty, thirty, forty, and caps at fifty. Is that, that's, that's the bravery bonus. bravery streak bonus. Right, the bravery streak bonus. So, one of those things, especially for anybody who's going to use an auto's box or a, a stone of experience, is to um, uh, if you're starting a new thing and you and you didn't finish on an elite quest or with a streak of 50% going, uh, you would definitely want to when you before you would stone um, use the stone of experience to go up all those levels. It's a great example um, of getting your stuff in order. It is, is running, say, five really low-level, super-fast quests to get that 50% XP back. You end up making 30,000 on the front end, and then you end up making another 60,000 on the back end, where you are collecting that 50% XP um, off of the higher-level quests. Is that getting too complicated? Probably. No, I don't. Uh, no, that's that's a good, really good tip. I think just to re-clarify it and make sure that it's it's nice and succinct is you're saying if you reincarnate and you don't have a bravery streak going before you use a stone of experience from an autos box or something, uh, run five quests on elite at while you're still at lower levels. Uh, quests are going to be a little easier than when you get up to higher levels, so you can establish your plus fifty percent bravery bonus before you take your stone, and then you'll have that full bonus right away when you come back from being stoned. Yeah, and that's definitely like it's about. It's, it ends up being about a hundred k difference, uh, or close to it, um, just with doing that. And all the di the only difference was about five minutes out of your time, ten max, you know. So right. and on if you do it the other way, it's it's another two two hours kind of deal, depending. But sure, it was a much better way of putting it than I did. <laughs> That's okay. I had the advantage of listening to you and being able to to rephrase it. So, what other stuff you have for tips for leveling? Ah, uh, let's see. Um, I could. I'm going to throw something ridiculous out there. This is just a kind of a. Um, <laughs> this is a personal thing I do, and I guess I can know a couple other people that do this. 
but having an, even an account that is a leveler account, like even if it's just for your lower levels, um, you could throw up a free account and uh, basically kit out a couple of tunes, um, characters at say levels 4 and level 6 or 7, who are always going to be ready to run those quests and you'll run through your character, especially something like a caster, like your melees are fine at lower levels, but something like a caster is often hard to uh, get things going. And this, this is again if you're soloing, if you're, if you like, you know, just joining random groups, then you won't need yourself to run them through. But if you're interested in fast leveling, that's kind of a fun idea. And it's also really fun too to to just max out a character at level four or seven. That probably sounds ridiculous, but it's a little fun side project on its own. Yeah, I've talked to some people that have kind of enjoyed the challenge of creating the perfect leveling tune kind of thing. I was just going to say, we won't talk about how many of those I have. <laughs> That's Definitely fair. a ridiculous hobby. Um, what about, uh, what kind of quests do you look for when you're you're running for XP? Uh, do you look for a specific kind of quest? Do you avoid specific kind of quests? Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, I do. Um, there's definitely your odd culprit quest uh, that is absolutely horrible as far as XP per minute. So I don't know what a standard ratio would be. That's good anymore because there's so much variance as you go up in levels. But um, there's some that you will certainly notice from life to life. You will likely make notes of things to never run again because the XP was horrible and the time and effort put in were obnoxious. Um, I guess none are springing to mind. That's probably because I haven't run them for so long. Um, whereas other ones are really good. So things at lower levels like the Kobold's new ringleader are quite good, and those are things that you might farm for a bit. Um, also, before I forget this one, uh, if you ever drink a higher percentage experience bonus pot, something like a 30% or a 50%, um, those can be kind of costly if you've paid anything for them. And uh, you might want to do a lot less running overall if you are using one of those potions. Um, they, I mean, if you're running around an explorer area, you could chew up like, you know, in, within three hours, you could easily chew up 30 minutes just running in explorers. And that's kind of, uh, it can be productive as well, but most likely just for the beginning five minutes and then wasteful after that. Yeah, one of the, we're talking about experience spots. One of the things that I try and do is when uh, my potion runs out, so I know I'm going to drink a new potion, I'll try and time running a, a longer quest uh, then so that I can wait until I'm like just at the end of the quest and drink that new potion. So, like, I particularly to do that with a coal chamber. Um, this is kind of one of my favorite ones to try and, and time that with because uh, coal can take a little while and it can go a little rough and there's a lot of jumping around and stuff like that. So I like to, instead of having to waste 40 minutes of a potion, an XP potion, while I'm running that quest, if, I can, if I'm already off that potion, run all the way into the quest and then I drink it right before the end fight and only use about two minutes off of that potion instead of the whole time in that quest. So I, I, li I really like waiting if if I'm off of a potion, waiting till the end of the quest to drink that ne that next potion, rather than drinking at the beginning of the quest. Indeed, very good point. Um, I think there's also you, you'll notice some quests where people like to farm. If you, particularly if you watch the elephant panel, you'll you'll see some at higher levels of quests that folks like to farm a lot. Um, at least for me, the way that the game is structured now with XP, what I try and do um, instead of just farming those quests. Uh, a lot really fast. Um, what I like to do is run them such that uh, you know I'll run it early as early as I can because it's a high yield quest and then I'll uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll run it kind of steadily after that instead of where, where I used to just run it like 10 times now it's like run it once a day kind of thing. Yeah with the new uh the new system they've brought in for all the ransack stuff, it's definitely, if, if you're going to be anywhere in any level range for an area, I'd say that's definitely the uh, 
the optimal way to go now is just to you know, do it your once a day and uh, and you know if you know it's your final day in the level range then you could go for two or three quick ones maybe one on each difficulty yeah and you can do two iterations of a quest on the same day and the next day you'll have the same the full XP bonus for it back so you can you can run the same quest a lot more than you used to um, are there any kind of level benchmarks that you look to try and reach? Um, and maybe you're kind of holding levels until you hit certain benchmarks or the levels that you try and get to as fast as possible? Uh, definitely a relative question. Like I think certain, I, I don't often uh, run cleric or favorite soul lives, but I do recall for certain in those lives that. Uh, whatever level level I got Blade Barrier at, I would race to. So I wouldn't hold any levels up till then, um, unless something was really easy. But uh, I would certainly uh, I would certainly rush as fast as I could to Blade Barrier, because Blade Barrier for uh, a Divine is certainly a game changer, right? Until then, you're, you're kind of stuck with um, kind of moderate to weenie tools and, and as soon as you pull up the blade barrier everything starts going a lot faster so definitely that um, and most most other tunes though like I mean if it's at all a tune that is capable of you know holding its own and like you can kind of carry a group I'll, uh, I'll always basically be holding a level from level one I mean same as anybody Actually, I guess people differ but I'm the kind of guy who would like Save my favorite part of my dinner for last. And it's kind of the same with uh, uh, XP, I guess. Is it's like I'd rather do the work up on the front end and then have it easier on the back end. I think usually these days what I go for is I I'll tend to hold the level as long as there's quests that uh, I want to run on Elite and get the streak for. So if I wouldn't get if by taking the level I wouldn't get the, the streak on a certain quest, I'll hold it until I get that quest through. Um, and then I'm usually kind of around seven, 16, 17, I kind of stop worrying about it and try to get to 18, uh, unless you know, unless that is still applies. But I'll try and get to 18, at which point I generally hold at 18, uh, because there's no, there's no really a, a great benefit, uh, at least in heroic terms, to get up to 19 or that fast because you you end up just shrinking the number of quests you can run for full XP as opposed to uh, making that set of quests larger. And also, I tend to have a lot right. of gear at 18 too. So yeah, that's definitely another big uh, factor. Is I mean, it kind of adds into the whole point about blade bar barriers. There is, uh, I mean, if there is any kind of crux things, you would look at on any given tune. Like so if yeah, if you've got a tune that was well kitted out at eighteen previously, then that would definitely be something to go for. Versus if one was, you know, well kitted out at sixteen, it gives you some extra time to really use that that good gear. Um something else that just uh um kinda popped into my head now is is I mean, I think most days most people are talking about holding their elite streak, but um uh, Sham and I often will run with somebody who's kind of <laughs> obsessed with sticking with elites as, as often as possible, but there's definitely uh, a trade-off to that. When you run elite, it, I mean, if it's easy, that's fine. If it's something that's going to be a difficult elite run is going to take you a long time, uh, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll just kind of start going on a hard streak. And while that does break your elite streak, there's oftentimes um, advantages to, to taking the hit there because you're going to get done your quests a lot faster, a lot easier, and you're ultimately you can potentially collect XP faster. And that, I think that's particularly more valuable information on the epics, but um, still applies to the heroics at certain points too, I think, especially for newer players. Yeah, there's definitely a skill thing involved there, and a build thing too. You know, there's certain builds that just are almost like playing an easy button, and when you get into epic elite stuff, they they can still solo stuff no problem. Um, Sharadi 
archers uh, or Swati casters and monk monkters uh, being two that kind of come to mind there. Um, yeah, I'd say that you know definitely look at how long is it to, is playing an elite quest worth it for you? It, does it take you too long to do it? Is it is it too hard? Is it worth just losing that that bravery streak? Um, you know, and it's something you kind of got to play with. I, generally speaking, we we both have kind of agreed that. Um, once you hit epic levels, epic hard is typically bang for the buck, faster and and better XP per minute than running epic elite. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the scaling, just because, in, you know, in, in heroic terms, if you go from hard to elite, the difference in boss hit points is not that much. But when you're talking about epic elite, when well, you're talking about going from, I, mean, I think I want to say that the skeletons in Madstone on epic hard. Um, are something around like twelve thousand hit points, and on Epic Elite they're up to like sixty thousand. So I mean, we're talking about a scale of five, just uh, from that example of how many more hit points things have. So it's definitely something to consider how fast you can run things. And as well, I guess something else to add in there is, um, I mean, these these are the variables can be dependent on uh, time of day you play, um, amount of friends you have available, what kind of guild you're in, because if you have people to run with all the time who are competent players and of a certain skill level, then Epic Elite isn't too much to tackle, but if you play off hours, you only have one or two friends to play with, or you end up soloing, then hard definitely becomes a much more viable option, so instead of waiting for a group and oftentimes running into failures, quest fails, or whatever else on Epic Elite. Um, you know, Epic Hard is, in my opinion, overall, it's it's easier than Elite Normal, you know, when you're talking about rel relative to level. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that, for sure. You know, I think kind of my general rule is if, you, you know, if I know the other players in the party that I'm going for, I might consider, okay, maybe I can do something a little harder than I could do by myself, but... If I'm just pugging uh, and I want to go fast, you know, what can I do reasonably on my own is kind of where I'm setting my difficulty benchmark. And for me, that means on heroic levels, yeah, I can handle most quests on Elite by myself if I need to. Maybe I have a higher or something like that. Um, and, you know, if I can't, then I don't run it, generally. <laughs> I'll try and wait for a, a party that I can go and, go and run it with. But uh, that's kind of how I tend to approach that a little bit. Um, what do you think about, is there any kind of gear that folks should be looking for if they're kind of new getting into the TR game? Uh, what kind of gear do you generally hold on to throughout your lives? Maybe might be very valuable for a reincarnator. Uh, I guess the first thing I'd kind of take a crack at there is um, just mention the crafting, the Canis crafting. Uh, so in House K and House Canis, House C, uh, there's a little crafting hall. I'm sure most people are familiar with this. If you're not, maybe look it up. But um, I think it, it it becomes probably well worth your while to at least, in my personal opinion, I've now pathetically leveled up uh, three um, crafters on three different accounts to to high level there. Um, and so, I mean, it's now obvious to me that it's quite easy. I think last last one I spent about maybe 200 turbine points and uh, 3 or 4 million plat. And uh, then from ground zero I took um, the the crafter up to like level 140, which is enough to craft anything. Um, and that's pretty big. In, in my opinion, it really um, helps ease some strain from leveling if it's something you can get into and learn. Because uh, it just gives you better weapons, um, it, you can customize your gear if you're having trouble finding anything, and in some cases uh, there's actually things that you can only get from from that crafting, so that's definitely one thing I'd look at. Um, let's see, I don't know, another one? Huh. I guess there's always the basics, or is that what we're kind of talking about sure, here? Sure, what, whatever you might gear for level? whatever you might think would be good. I, I've done like plus six stat items usually pretty good. Um, I usually keep a uh, a false life a, as low level as I can. 
uh, greater false life item um, just to kind of beef up hit points at certain levels. Um, obviously, you know, most of my characters have something that has heavy fortification on it, but, you know, uh, low-level fortification items I think would be uh, pretty useful. Low-level striders, uh, low, uh, something low-level that has featherfall on it comes to mind as well. There's a few places where that can be handy. Well, here, I guess that's, uh, that's something that kind of that slid by me. I thought of it earlier, and it's gone, but it, again, relevant here. Um, again, to talk about that uh, Kenneth crafting um, with the new augment system now. I uh, wish I could show this. Basically, on all my tunes, um, I now have a belt that they can equip that has Featherfall and in a colorless lot. It has the Master's Gift. Um, so the Master's Gift is an augment that you can make um, if you're going to TR. And you would run the, uh, the Threnal chain, and you would grab some... Uh, um, you you would grab the end reward for that chain. There is is the uh, mantle of the world shaper. Yeah. Mantle of the world shaper, and then the master's gift from uh, the Delirious chain. And uh, what you need is five greater tokens of the twelve. So you need you get those from uh, raids. So you might run the dragon or the, the um, demon queen or whatever raids you can get in on. So you collect five of those. Uh, it's some work, but it's overall not bad. But um, that's a great augment to go in a colorless slot. And if you get your crafting up just even to a moderate level, uh, you can drop that minimum level requirement. So basically at level one you have feather falling and a permanent 5% enhancement bonus for your XP. So that's definitely something that all of my TR teams have on right now. And it's worth mentioning too, like the, the voice of the master of the mental world shape world shaper have that plus five uh, to XP enhancement. Uh, and there's also one in the um, the Shadowfall Conspiracy quests. Uh, I don't remember what it's called, but it has Vitality 40, and then it has the, the same uh, Heroic Inspiration, the 5% XP. But uh, all of those have minimum level requirements, whereas the Augment, you can, you, like you said, you can have it ready to go at level 1. So especially if you're going to use a Stone of Experience, I, I mean, I... At five percent, that's actually a hundred thousand, another hundred thousand uh, XP. So, in my opinion, it's well worth just doing once, and then it's on that character for good. Yeah, which is worth mentioning too. If you're going to use a stone, you know, find all the XP bonuses you can. You know, drink a pot uh, if you have one around that you you're willing to use. Use a get that five percent, and use your ship's uh, your ship's uh, XP shrine because that all applies to that experience that you get granted. Yeah, each 1% is uh, 20,000. So even a ship, uh, you know, finding somebody's ship with a 5% XP shrine versus a 4%, it's it's a 20,000 XP difference. Which is effectively so, a quest. Yeah, basically. Obviously, each percent is going to add up. So, and For anybody who doesn't know, I... I kind of more or less just started paying more attention to this. But um, an XP stone is 2 million XP, and uh, each bonus just is a direct percentage of that. So, I mean, your 50% is 50% of 2 million, another 5, 10% for your, your VIP subscription is another 10, so you're, you're at 65 then. Um, this might sound all pretty obvious, but I guess uh, with the way certain things have worked in DDO before, such as um, electrical absorptions and things like that, to me, <laughs> to me, it's not quite so obvious. It's something you would hope for, but anyway, it is that direct with XP. Yeah, so and that's, that's nice. the newer stones are the ones that have the two million bonus on them. It, it used to be that it would just take you from level 8 to 16, so it was kind of a little bit more of an ambiguous value of the stone. Now it's just, here's 2 million XP. Yeah, definitely. Round light, or Giving it a specific number certainly helped, uh, helped everything become more obvious there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about kind of a, a cost-benefit analysis. Um, we're going to kind of talk about... Is TR is TRing right for you? Like, why would you necessarily want to do it? Um, obviously, there's the past life feature, which is kind of the the big deal. Um, 
So uh, what are some of the, the good past life feats? What are some past life feats that you really like to get? Uh, well, I'm a lover of ranged characters. Um, so, for example, uh, if you're going to max out your extra damage on a, a ranged character for either an artificer or a, or a rogue or a ranger, whatever you got, or a muncher, um, it's certainly nice to say get three e for each ranger pass life. It's two extra ranged damage, and for each monk pass life, it's one extra damage for any any damage. So I mean, if you're going to max those out, that's a total of nine. Now, obviously, any one of those on their own isn't going to be a big deal. But if you've been able to put the time into it, that's a pretty big difference. Very much at lower levels, and if you focus to the extreme on it, um, even at epic levels, it's, it shows through quite a bit. Um, yeah, I, I really uh, I feel bad for people like myself who y you're always looking for that one extra little bit to make it that little extra bit better because it takes a lot of time. But at the end of the day, too, there's obviously a reward for it in that you know your, your character is that much better. See, also like the uh, the wizard past life feat is pretty good. Uh, you can get uh, the one that you you have to actually select it. Um, each each of the um, classes has a, a passive past life feat, and, and one that one that you just get just by having that past life. And there's another feat that you have to select. Uh, that's prerequisite is the past life the passive past life feat. And the wizard one um, that you have to select gives plus one to all your DCs. Uh, and then the passive one gives uh, plus two to spell penetration, um, so that's a pretty useful one as well. Uh, the barbarian one gives hit points. Paladin one gives uh, healing amp, which uh, are I think are all both good things for just about every character in the game. Yeah, there's certainly actually that's the wizard one in particular too, the one that you take as a feat um, as you're leveling uh, the arcane prodigy. Um, that's actually really good for Sharati casters, for example. It it very ma very much adds to their arsenal of uh, things that they can throw out there. Um, so that's a definitely a good example of uh, one that I mean any of my casters have that on them. Yeah, I think some of the other like I, I think favorite soul adds to spell penetration as well, which you know it's not necessarily useful against all monsters, but there's certainly some monsters that have some pretty decent spell penetration. Um, drow and outsiders uh, being probably the foremost that, that that applies to. As far as talking about who uh, TRing is right for, I would definitely, uh, that's a very good question that I probably would have been wise to ask myself a couple times in the past before embarking on um, reincarnation missions. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's just depending on your your time resources and your uh, financial as well. Like if you're somebody who's never going to buy an autos box, then uh, I would say don't look too much at the uh, you know at the tring stuff. I mean, certainly go for a few, and maybe even especially if you focus on one character. But if you're a chronic case like myself and many others, including Sham where you enjoy playing a lot of different characters, uh, it can kind of get messy pretty fast if you've got kind of grand designs for too many things. It, it starts to get a little overwhelming if you start thinking, man, I can get completion on, on all 14 of my... Ooh, that's a lot of work. <laughs> can you imagine? Yeah, that's that's a long... That would be a long, hard road, that's for sure. I think, though, for me at least, um, I'm kind of resigned to, this, to the point where um, you know, leveling in and of itself is always something I've really enjoyed about the game and kind of building characters. And one nice thing about the reincarnation system is it allows me to keep my characters uh, and keep working on them while simultaneously kind of dabbling and playing with different character builds. Um, like, I'm on my, I'm on my third iteration of... Uh, of TRing with this character with actually the, the intention of doing a few past lives. 
Um, and each one's been a little different and just kind of playing with the class splits and, and the feats and figuring out what kind of things work well for um, kind of partly just for normal gameplay, but also with the intention of trying to level as fast as possible, which I haven't necessarily been doing that great of a job. Ah, but. Uh, but who has? Yes, indeed. Well, that, do you have any uh, anything else you want to add to, uh, to throw out there for folks that are looking for tips on how to reincarnate faster, more efficiently, better? Um, I definitely throw this out there. The whole, uh, again, finances versus time versus whatever. Um, if you're not going to run a lot of epic quests, like either if you don't um, own certain packs or whatever, um, that's definitely one thing that makes it easier on people that constantly TR is just uh, the ability and the willingness to run um, epic content, uh, especially, um, am I thinking of this right? Any Anyone that basically gives out fragments of the 12, because uh, at the end of the day, that's where all your free uh, parts of wood come from. I certainly wouldn't be buying those things uh, from the turbine the turbine store all the time. The only reason I'm able to reincarnate as much as I do is because I'm constantly taking those uh, tokens that I get each life and recycling them into the TR, uh, the hearts. Sometimes he borrows them from friends. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Indeed. Uh, I would say, just as a closing thought uh, for me, is if you don't find it fun, don't do it. Really, when you look at the grand scheme of things, uh, whether or not you're, you know, maybe you try one at least, um, and you do get extra, I guess we didn't mention this, you do get extra build points. Uh, you get two extra build points uh, for your second and third. Uh, so you get a, um, what is it, 36 point build. So that's how you, you get to allocate those build points towards your stats so you can get a little better stats. But really, when, when push comes to shove and, and at the end of the day, a character that's on its first life is not going to be vastly underpowered compared to someone who's run a bunch of past lives. So, you know, don't feel pressured to, to get into this kind of a game if you don't want to. Uh, it's not the end-all, be-all of, of DDO. You know, if, if you find it fun, then have at it. But if you don't find it fun and you find it a drag, you know, don't don't worry about it. We've we've got a Gildy who, you know, he's not really big into reincarnation. He's done a few. Um, and he still does them occasionally, but he's not doing a whole lot of them. So, you know, you you don't need to go too crazy with that if you don't want to. Yeah, for sure, I'd agree that. Uh, I mean, tiering is basically a tool for people who um, like to get obsessive about, you know, either one tune or maybe a couple, and really tweak it out really nicely. Um, even though, as as Chandler quite rightly mentions, is that you know um, uh, at the end of the day, most of the difference in things comes down to skill of player, um, difficulty of quest, uh, party makeup, but also your uh, your ability to enjoy the game too, <laughs> like. Um, it's it's really I, I totally just fully agree. It's really not worth it. I've taken breaks from tiering because I wasn't enjoying it, and I've uh, just gone back completely to questing and enjoying quests. So definitely don't feel pressured. Yeah. Well, that I'll say uh, thanks again to Stocks. Uh, thanks for being a part of the conversation, and I uh, hope to have you on in the future. Well, thanks for having me. Around. A special thanks to Stocks for joining me for that uh, discussion there. I appreciated the time that he took to do that. I hope that discussion was uh, valuable to most of you that are looking uh, at doing some reincarnating, especially with the way that the game seems to be moving more and more in that direction. Uh, what have I been doing this week? Uh, I did manage to cap my current TR project again, uh, and I'm ready to, to reincarnate, although I took Stocks' advice, and I have not yet done so because I was tired when I was ready to do so. Uh, so I'll be doing that uh, this week. Also got uh, a couple of tunes, actually, uh, through their 20th Fall of Truths. So I got some uh, kind of a mixed bag of in rewards, actually. Um, I 
I did get a uh, a tome, a stat tome that I I could use. However, I chose to pass on it instead and take the uh, Halcyon boots uh, for my archer. Um, figured that the extra little boost in uh, potency from wearing the boots uh, and the extra spell points too would be handy. But really, the potency uh, would be pretty nice for some of the Sharati effects uh, that are about. Let's see, lightning post uh, this week. These are a, a couple of questions that we had from uh, the survey that I, I just completed uh, late in last year. Um, and they're kind of more one, more questions that I can answer by myself, not so much great questions for having other folks. So I'm going to answer a few of them now. I'll see a few from, for later. There were quite a few questions that kind of fall in that category. Um, but Arthur wrote in, are there more show times or just on the weekends? Uh, mostly shows will only be on the weekend, um, but they are always subject to my own and guest availability, um, which is why they're mostly on the weekends. Uh, it, you know, just during the week, sometimes it can be really hard to, to catch people. And really, it's kind of the, the reason why uh, the live shows tend to be kind of in the mornings on Saturday uh, or Sunday, just because, you know, it's, it's kind of before people generally get going for the day. Most people tend to make plans more in the evenings as opposed to the afternoons and morning. Um, so that's kind of what I generally try and target for them. Um, it's highly unlikely that there will ever be more than one serious show in a week. Uh, if there ever is, it will probably essentially be one show broken up into two shows. Um, or I've also considered uh, if I get many segments, uh, if that kind of picks up again, I might just release those as their own independent things as opposed to trying to shoehorn them into a show. Hansi asks, can you elaborate more on Twists of Fate and how they work? Uh, and yes, I can, and I'll do my best. We'll also link uh, the DDO wiki page for this. Uh, twists of Fate are a function of the Epic Destiny system. You have three twist slots that you can upgrade with twist points. You get one point for every three Epic Destiny levels and another one Fate point uh, for every four Epic Pass Life feats. Um, with those Fate points, you can both unlock and upgrade your three Fate slots. Uh, it costs an increasing number of points to unlock successive twist slots. Uh, so the first twist slot you need to uh, unlock only costs one point. The second slot requires two points. The third slot requires three. Additionally, it costs an increasingly more points to upgrade those slots. Uh, so whenever you upgrade uh, a slot by one level, it costs one more point than it cost the last time that you either unlocked it or upgraded it. Uh, so when a slot is unlocked, it can hold a level one Epic Destiny ability Upgrading it allows you to uh, put in a level 2, 3, and then 4 ability uh, to be slotted into those slots. Uh, you can't slot in any of the core abilities or tier 5 abilities. Um, the way it works basically is as you level, you get points. You unlock those Twists of Fate slots. Um, and then you activate a particular destiny. And then it gives you a list on the right of all the abilities that you have active in that, that destiny. You can then drag... Uh, any eligible ability, so you have to, again, remember that level requirement, you can drag any of those abilities and drop them into those Twist of Fate slots. And then when you switch your destiny to something else, you will still have access to that destiny uh, ability. Um, so it gives you a little bit of flexibility um, even when you're not you're outside of those destinies. Um, one of the more popular ones would be the uh, Rejuvenation Cocoon out of primal the Primal Destiny. Um, that's a pretty nice little cheap heal spell, and it's really low level. Um, there's also um, the, the Energy Sheath out of uh, Draconic Incarnation is really popular for Fall of Truth, um, and even some other applications. Um, but, you know, it's kind of, people use what they uh, what they like to round out their, their builds with their epic destinies. Windchant Night Song writes, any chance of an in-depth discussion of Eldritch Knight Prestige? Um, probably not, uh, at least not for me. If there is, it would likely come in the form of a segment submitted by a fan. So here's kind of why. Builds are a really tough thing to cover. There are just so many builds, uh, and builds are only one of the things that I try to have in the roundtable discussion rotation. I try and kind of cover various topics, and builds, of course, being one of them, but I don't just want to spend all the time on builds, which would be very easy to do so. For that reason, what I prefer to do is talk in more general and principled terms, i.e., what are some basics that the classes bring to builds, and how can you capitalize on those? Now, having said that, when we do talk about builds, what I try and do is have the guests and myself create builds within the given prompt, um, but slightly different. The idea being that you can highlight how you can make different characters using those principles. Um, Propane and I did this uh, several weeks ago when we talked about two-handed barbarians. 
Um, I made more of a traditional barbarian build. Uh, he went more for a tactical build, and then we compared them. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going to go more with uh, builds. I don't necessarily intend on focusing on one enhancement tree. Um, it's a little too focused uh, in terms of build discussion. And I don't want to get bogged down in having build discussion be such a huge part of the show because there's so many other aspects that I want to, and uh, and other players want to kind of hear discussions about. Albert writes in, how hard is it to get devs onto the show? Uh, well, this is kind of a two-fold question. Uh, in regards to Cordovan and Tolero, it's not any more so difficult than a regular guest. Uh, in fact, Cordovan is probably one of the uh, more frequent guests in my uh, rotation. Um, however, in regards to all the other devs, ask me next week. With that, I'll say thanks to Stocks again uh, for being a part of this week's show and for uh, joining the DDO cast contribution team. Uh, thanks to all the other cast contributors. Uh, thank you for listening to the show as well. Uh, we hope that you enjoy it uh, and that you tell your uh, game friends about it. Um, spread the word. Uh, spread the knowledge. Uh, we thank Turbine and Wizards as well for uh, making the game. Um, even, when it, uh, even when it's frustrating, we still love to play uh, the game. Uh, that's why we're still here. Uh, we thank Cyber Ears as well for hosting our podcast. We really appreciate that. You can hit us up at ddocast.com for show notes, our calendar, previous shows, swag, and other fun stuff. If you want to be a part of the show or just say hi, you can email us at ddocast at gmail.com. You can also find us on social media and follow us for the latest cast updates. Closing tip for the week comes from Yahtzee Boom. If you really want to enjoy the game, play a reasonably self-sufficient character that frees you to run with pugs, friends, gillies, whatever, and have fun. Uh, he recommends that you use Healing Amp, UMD, Scrolls, Half-Elf Cleric, Dilettante, uh, the Warforge Race, uh, and or Silver Flame Potions. Uh, I thought that was rather appropriate given our discussion on TR Tips. So with that, until next time, may all your attack rolls be crits, all your chests live appropriate, have fun, and don't forget to wait till you're awake to TR. Thank you.